Uh, thank you everyone for joining this uh, webinar on history of adaptive testing. Uh, this is uh, more like a, a podcast interview with Professor David Weiss at the University of Minnesota and co-founder of Assessment Systems, uh, talking about how he got interested in adaptive testing and item response theory um, and where that uh, research led him. So uh, I'll be asking him uh, a, a set of questions that I have prepared, but you guys are also welcome to leave questions in the chat as we go along. And uh, we're able to uh, discuss those as, uh, you know, hopefully if we have a time at the end of the slope, we don't have a hard stop. And if we need to ask more questions, we can continue that discussion. Also, this is being recorded. Uh, so hopefully it'll be up on our YouTube channel and uh, perhaps published as a podcast someday as well too. All right. So uh, uh, first of all, uh, Dr. Weiss, uh, where did you grow up? I grew up in... <clears throat> West Philadelphia, went to West Philadelphia High School, which was the equivalent of West Side Story in terms of uh, a, a range of race and ethnicity and that sort of thing. And uh, graduated there in 1954, went to the University of Pennsylvania in 55, took a year off and uh, graduated from there in 59 and came out to Minneapolis and been here ever since. Cool. Uh, though, those of you in my generation won't be thinking West Side Story. You'll be thinking of uh, Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, West, West Philadelphia, born and raised. It's a, well, there, there was a remake of West Side Story just recently. Wasn't there? Yeah, it, it's still around. Yeah, okay. Uh, how did you get first interested in assessment? Uh, there's a story that you once told me about uh, um, uh, a digit repeating task? Well, I was <clears throat> a junior at University of Pennsylvania, majoring in psychology. And <clears throat> that department was full of what I call rat runners. <laughs> about uh, only two or three of the faculty did anything with people. So they're all running rats. And there were a few courses that had to do with people. One of those courses was a course in tests and measurements, which I took mainly because it was one of the few applied courses that were available. When I say applied, it had anything to do with people rather than rats and pigeons. But um, in that class, the instructor was going through various kinds of tests and <clears throat> she got to the uh, Stanford Binet IQ test, uh, which is, if you're not familiar with it, it's an individually administered IQ test. Um, where a psychologist sits across the table from a kid and asks them various kinds of questions depending on their age. And it is uh, an adaptive procedure in which the, uh, the administrator has a choice of questions to ask from different levels of difficulty, which were stratified by age. And uh, in the process of going through this test, she went through, uh, there were some verbal kinds of questions and some uh, numerical kinds of questions and some problem solving. One of my favorite problem solving questions was, you know, you're walking down the street and you see an envelope on the ground that's stamped an address. What do you do? There's a problem. Okay, well, the correct answer, of course, is you, you'd be a good kid and you pick it up and you put it in the mailbox when there were mailboxes on every corner. And, um, <laughs> My facetious answer, of course, <laughs> growing up in Philadelphia was you pick it up, you rip off the stamp so you can use it yourself, and then you open it up and look to see um, if there's anything in there you can use to blackmail somebody. <laughs> <laughs> but that, that, uh, that thinking, which I did not express in class, um, led me to, to begin to think about the measurement of intelligence and how it is, uh, it, it is based largely on your experiences as you grow up. And then there was the question of whether well, there's different kinds of intelligences, uh, different kinds of, uh, of tasks at different levels of the uh, Stanford Binet IQ test. And one of them that got me interested was um, what we call number series. In a number series, the psychologist reads a series of numbers, two, five, seven, six, four, and so on and then you're supposed to repeat them back. And so they start with um, four, did four numbers, four digits, then they go to five, then they go to six and so on. And 
different students in the class were reaching their limit at six or seven um, digits. And uh, the instructor said, anybody think they can go further? I raised my hand. Well, anyway, to make the story shorter, uh, I got up to 12 digits. And then she said, okay, well, now we're going to do it. I'm going to read a different set of numbers and, and I'm going to ask you to repeat them backward. And so I did that and I got up to 12 digits. Nobody else could do that. Do that. And then I started thinking about, this is a highly selected Ivy League school and everybody's supposed to be very quote intelligent, right? But why is there this enormous range of individual differences in the ability just to repeat a series of numbers? And so I began thinking about individual differences, individual differences underlying individual differences, of course, is measurement. That's how we describe individual differences in psychology. And that was my uh, initial exposure to measurement. And that's how I got interested in it. Very cool. Yeah, that uh, story always sticks with me since uh, the same thing happened when I was an undergraduate and we did the number series when talking about IQ tests and I was the only one that could do it when they did it backwards. How many did you do? <laughs> they only went up to eight. They didn't go up to 12. No. Um, and, but the, and then they were just done like that was a good enough example. Well, I probably could have gone beyond 12. I think it resulted from my musical training um, where you sort of uh, think of things in measures and four four time is four per measure and so i broke it up into four and this was chunking which they hadn't talked about in those days and i hadn't identified it but looking back i kind of learned chunking from music and then i applied that to the number series test <clears throat> you're being efficient and i suppose <laughs> you, your interest in efficiency will efficiency will show up later too as well so how my did you choose where to go to grad school uh, university of minnesota I, came out here in 1959 and they never got rid of me. <laughs> what made you pick uh, University of Minnesota? Uh, it was <clears throat> recommended to me by um, Morris Vitellis, who was uh, <clears throat> one of the principal developers of industrial organizational psychology. And I took a seminar with him. It was a graduate seminar. And uh, we worked in his vocational guidance clinic and I was administering tests and scoring them and, and that sort of stuff. And um, I had applied to Ohio State who had a good program at that time uh, in, in psychology. And they turned me down because I applied in clinical, which was very fortunate. And so I uh, asked him where to go. <laughs> He told me where to go, but I'm not for school. <laughs> uh, I, in this seminar, I used to sit with my feet up on the table waiting for him. And I, I, I always sit with my feet up on the table. I don't know why I still do it. And he, he would walk in and he would go like this. Why well, get your feet off the table? But anyway, so he recommended the University of Minnesota. He said, go to a school where they have a wide range of uh, of coursework and programs and that sort of thing if you don't know what you want, want to do and you'll find something there that that you like to do and so I got in I applied in counseling and clinical I was admitted to both and um, stayed in counseling because clinical psychology and those days had no idea what they were doing oh, especially their, their measurements were terrible so who was your advisor at Minnesota then? Um, who'd, who'd you work with? My advisor was Lloyd Lofquist, who was counseling, rehab counseling psychologist, but he was just my nominal advisor. I worked with Renee Dowis, who was uh, the project director on a project that I worked on for <clears throat> actually for 11 years. And uh, I learned everything that I knew from him for 11 years, more than I learned in any class. That's quite a lot, and I suppose similar to my experience in working with you. Uh, what was your dissertation about? Oh, it was called a technique for curvilinear multivariate prediction, which was uh, a uh, supposed uh, replacement for linear multiple regression because it could take into account simultaneously linear and nonlinear relationships, and I 
showed that in my dissertation that uh, the um, cross-validation stability of the results from my method was better than that of linear regression, even when the regressions were completely linear and um, never did much with it after that. Still interesting. It's still, you know, still out there. And I wrote one or two papers applying it and never caught on. And so I got involved in other stuff. I used to do a lot in what I call applied statistics. And I kind of gave, gave that up when I got in deeply into measurement. Ah, cool. Uh, Guillermo Fasadi just noted that he studied at U of M with uh, Dr. Brunings. You recognize that name? Brunings? Mm-hmm. Brunings was, oh, okay. Bob Brunings was in uh, Ed Psych and he later became the president of the university for a period of years. I don't wow. remember what his research area was. Interesting. Well, thank you for sharing that, Guillermo. Uh, so after you graduated at a, a grad school, what sort of work did you do? Well, I worked on this uh, work adjustment project with Renee Dowis, which was, uh, in vocational psychology and did a lot of instrument development for uh, vocational psychology applied to vocational rehabilitation, um, working on primarily methods for predicting job satisfaction from uh, what we call vocational needs or preferences for satisfiers and occupations and developing methods for measuring uh, what we call occupational reinforcer patterns, which were these patterns of satisfiers in various jobs. And uh, I started working on that project on day one and uh, stayed with it for 11 years. Did anything there prime you for your later work in the 70s when you got into IRT and CAT and the psychometric methodologies? Well, what primed me for it was my use of computers, basically. I started yeah. using computers, uh, which were big, ugly, vacuum tube things at first uh, that generated more heat than the air conditioner on top of the building that I'm in right now. But um, <clears throat> I, I got very proficient with computers in those days. I taught computer programming when I first came into psychology to get other uh, students and faculty. I had some faculty in my classes learned how to use computers. And, um, one of them still is programming in Fortran from when I taught them in 1970-71. Uh, so it was my exposure to computers and the capabilities of computers that, that got me into um, in the measurement. In the uh, 1960s, and I don't remember how this happened, but I had an exposure to the Plato system, which was developed at the University of Illinois. It was a very early, um, for then, very high-tech um, interactive computer system that uh, on which they were delivering instructional uh, uh, materials in program instruction, uh, branched instruction, basically. And I looked at that and I thought, well, if, if you can deliver instruction this way, we can deliver tests this way. And that's basically how I got into computer-based testing. Wow, when computers were still the size of a room, I suppose. Well, the, yeah, the, the system that was running the Plato system, was, by then it was solid state in the 60s. Uh, when I started in the late 50s, it was still vacuum tubes. But, um, and they had these uh, terminals that had graphics capabilities and all this sort of stuff, but they were very, very slow. And so the cartoons of the day uh, were somebody sitting in front of the Plato system with um, uh, spider webs holding them up because they had to wait so long for a response from the system to their program instruction. But in the, the mid seventies, the mid sixties rather, was the, the Plato period and uh, Plato was supposed to replace teachers in the sixties. And of course it never did. Uh, and it eventually disappeared. And now of course, with the capabilities that we have now, things, but it's a long, still a long way off. Yeah, it is. Uh, so you mentioned coming back to the, the psych department, and uh, how did you end up back in the psych department as faculty? <laughs> These were the days before 
um, before you had to have a search to hire somebody. So it turns out that my, my former advisor uh, became uh, assistant vice president for academic affairs at the university. And he saw, and I saw that the research money was running out. Uh, we were funded for 11 years from the rehab funding, vocational rehab funding. And so uh, mysteriously a new position, <laughs> position appeared in the psychology department and I was pointed to it. Oh, wow. <laughs> no interviews, no nothing. Uh, so did you start working on IRT and CAT when you first came to the psych department or did you slowly get into that then? Well, in the first year in the psychology department, which was 1970, I got a small grant from the uh, graduate school and I hired a programmer who was a graduate, former graduate student of mine who got into statistics, uh, into uh, programming. And we programmed the uh, adaptive version of, of the Stanford Binet. We, we programmed the adaptiveness of the Stanford Binet into what I later called the uh, stratified adaptive computer computerized test into a mainframe using the console. So we were the, probably the first to deliver any kind of adaptive test on a computer um, in 1970. And then um, one day in 1970, uh, or maybe early 71, I don't recall, a guy from the Office of Naval Research wandered into my office in Elliott Hall and said, what are you up to? So I told him what I had been doing for 11 years. And then he said, well, what are you interested in doing? And so I said, no, I'm interested in um, uh, using computers to deliver tests. And he said, asked me a couple of questions. He said, okay, write me a letter and we'll find you. Wow. Just like you get in the professor position. <laughs> yeah. So I wrote him a two page letter and it started 15 years of funding. Oh my gosh. Uh, so no, 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 no competitiveness in those days. You know, that's just the way they did it. And um, this guy from ONR went around to various people in various sciences and trying to find people to support. They stumbled on me. <laughs> that was history. <laughs> wow. What a coincidence. Funny how that works. Yeah, uh, it, was, it was a coincidence. So what stood out to you about the stratified adaptive approach? Uh, you know, what shortcomings did it have and how did that lead you to some other discoveries? Well, there were a bunch of issues. One is um, uh, when you break up your items by difficulty into strata levels of difficulty, which is what the Stanford Bidet did. Um, you got a bunch of items, let's say, uh, that differ that are similar in difficulty and what Benet did was, was he had items that were 0.5 difficulty for a particular age group and then his stratification was by age but we didn't have age for most variables so we simply did it by difficulty well anyway when you stratify by difficulty your items are going to differ by discrimination and so one question was well do we put the highly discriminating items first do we put them last do we put them does it matter um, secondly uh, it was the question about well how do you new, add new items to the bank there was no way of linking items into a, an existing bank in classical test theory and so that was an issue another issue was well how do you score the darn thing um, and so we came up with like 10 different ways of scoring this thing based on the difficulty of the items and the variation of difficulty for an individual, which, which we uh, looked at as sort of an, an, error, uh, an error measurement indicator. And so we had all of these questions that we couldn't handle within the context of classical test theory. So my graduate students at the time uh, was Isaac Behar, uh, Jim McBride, Brad Simpson, and Dave Vale uh, said, let's look at item, <laughs> item response theory. And I said, no, that's too damn complicated. It's not going to work. 
because I had a class in uh, advanced measurement, which I have now been teaching for many years. And uh, it was taught by a guy who uh, walked in, walked up to the blackboard, picked up a piece of chalk, faced the blackboard and derived equations. Oh, I hate that. that. That was item response theory. No discussion of how to use it, no discussion of what it means, uh, no discussion of uh, how, how you estimate theta. Well, maybe he did talk about estimating theta, but um, it was all equations and I just didn't resonate to that. So I got to be in the class. <laughs> but anyway, uh, so when my graduate students brought it up, I said, no, as I said, that's, that's, that's too complicated. It's not going to work. Well, they basically dragged me into it, kicking and screaming until, until I finally understood what the implications of it were for the problems that we had. And then I was all in. Okay. Cool. Uh, it wasn't so, my decision, it was their decision. So how did you uh, first work to apply IRT to the concept of adaptive testing? Well, um, it enabled us to uh, a way of, of selecting, once you had an item bank, enabled us to select items by item information. Uh, it enabled us to link items into a bank, to develop a large bank, and enable us to estimate theta with any subset of items that an individual took. Um, and all of these problems were not solvable in the, in the context of classical test theory. And then we realized that, hey, we don't have to stratify our items by difficulty. We don't have to worry about whether items differ by uh, how to use discrimination within the strata. And you know, all, all those issues just sort of evaporated. And because it solved all those problems, we continue to pursue it. Would you say that was the important breakthrough with adaptive testing was the application of IRT? Yeah, and actually it was really the first application of IRT. We were applying IRT to adaptive testing way before anybody was developing any real tests using IRT. Oh, very cool. Uh, was there any research going on outside the U of M in terms of IRT and CAT? Yeah, there were a few people. Um, well, there are people doing IRT research. Uh, Daryl Bach, for one, who just died recently, um, did a lot of important work in IRT, including developing the marginal maximum likelihood estimation procedure, and his students have done a lot. Um, there was uh, the other people that ONR, Office of Naval Research, supported were Mark Rikesh, uh, who at that time was at the University of Missouri, and he moved elsewhere later, Michigan State, I think it was. Uh, Fumiko Samajima, who did some of the basic uh, uh, mathematical work underlying IRT uh, recase primarily so that his work didn't uh, uh, duplicate my work, primarily concentrated on the, uh, the multidimensional case of IRT and that, that's been his major contribution. And um, we use some, some of the work that uh, Fumiko did in, uh, in some, some of our applications as well. And, and there were other people in the, these, these were just the very early years. The, the three people that ONR supported were me, Mark Rikesh, and uh, Fumiko Samajima. And then later on, others came forward. Mm -hmm. uh, so you, you mentioned uh, Dave Bale, Brad Simpson, uh, Jim McBride. Uh, so what was some of that team that you had uh, as part of the psychometrics uh, research lab in the 70s and where did they end up? Uh, well, the two most prominent, well, in, in the 70s, it was, it was uh, Dave Vale who started assessment systems with me in uh, 1979. Um, Brad Simpson is known for the Simpson header algorithm for uh, item exposure. Uh, Jim McBride ended up uh, working for the ASVAB, was uh, one of the uh, major psychometricians for the ASVAB development. And the ASVAB was the main reason why ONR wanted to support adaptive testing because they wanted a computer-based adaptive version of 
the Armed Services Vocational Aptitude Battery, and it's been running now for 30, 40 years, something like that, about 30 years, I think. Um, and uh, let's see, oh, Jim, Jim McBride spent a number of years with the ASVAB, and then he ended up working for a, a testing company in Wisconsin, whose name always escapes me for some reason or other. Renaissance um, Learning. Pardon me? Renaissance Learning. Renaissance Learning, yeah, that's right. And, uh, and they've developed a, uh, a series of adaptive um, of tests for reading and math and stuff like that. Then in later years, in the, uh, that was the 70s and the 80s, there was uh, uh, Gage Kingsbury, who ended up single-handedly uh, developing the adaptive uh, Tests that became the Northwest Evaluation Association, NWEA tests. I don't remember what they call them. Do you remember, Nate? Uh, they're called Measures of Academic Progress, MAP. Yep. Measures of Academic Progress, you're right. Yep. And then there was Tony Zara, who single-handedly went to uh, the, uh, the nurses' um, licensing uh, organization in Chicago and single-handedly developed the whole nursing license exam and then eventually moved with that exam to Pearson. And he's still at Pearson. Those, those are the, the uh, major players who are, who are my students. Okay, that, that's quite the team. Uh, so where did the, the CAT research go after that? Um, you know, you, like when did you finish uh, the O&R research? Um, and then they later started applying it to the ASVAB. Um, and where did it go after that? Like into Polytimus, you eventually got in, uh, interested in healthcare assessment. Can you speak about that? Well, that's a multi-pronged question. <laughs> okay, <laughs> we'll start with the 1980s piece first and then we'll go back to the healthcare. <clears throat> well, the, the O&R uh, supported me from 1971 through 1985, we had um, three or four CAT conferences that I organized and hosted. And there was one that was, the first one was in Washington. And after that, uh, I took care of, uh, of hosting the conferences about every two years, we did 1977, 79, 81, I think in 85, I don't quite remember. Uh, th those conference proceedings are all up on the uh, the uh, website of uh, IACAT, the International Association for Computerized Adaptive Testing. And um, then, let's see, after, after the ONR funding ended, I had in the process started the Journal of Applied Psychological Measurement, and my CAT research sort of was kind of ad hoc there for quite a while until I sold the uh, journal to Sage Publishing in 19, 1999, 2000, somewhere around there after editing for 25 years. Um, then I started uh, an a bunch of unsupported cat research. And then about six years ago, I, uh, I worked uh, with Robert Gibbons at the University of Illinois on a project uh, uh, at the University of Chicago, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, now, I think it's a Chicago, maybe it's at Illinois, but anyway, uh, Gibbons was one of Bach's students and, and we did uh, a uh, several year long project in mental health, uh, developing cat-based methods of depression and anxiety and that sort of thing. And, and uh, he has set up a company that's been uh, making those available. And um, after that, there were a couple of years and I got involved in a project with the Mayo Clinic, which ran for six years, just ended last year, in which we were looking at um, adaptive testing for what's called patient reported outcomes. There was a, a big uh, PRO patient reported outcomes projects funded by the uh, National Institutes of Mental Health and that was at Northwestern University, but they didn't do anything with hospitalized patients. And so the Mayo Clinic uh, got funded to work on development of patient reported outcome measures, adaptive patient reported outcome measures with hospitalized patients. And um, we were looking at it from a multidimensional cat 
point of view using multidimensional IRT because everything that was done in the PROMISE project, which is the big project that was funded uh, by NIH, everything that was done in the PROMISE project was unidimensional. And um, we thought that we could get uh, better results looking at it multidimensionally. And I worked with Chun Wang, who was here at the time, and I'm still working with her on um, a new Mayo project, which is coming up, um, which expands upon some of the work we did in the previous project, and that's in the process being funded now. So that's another five-year project, and um, hopefully I'll still be around in five years to complete that project. I hope so, too. Um, Garibald Fasadi asked a question, how far are we today from the time of the microcat testing system? How far away? Are we, have we come since the microcat testing system? Well, the microcat testing system was uh, the first adaptive testing system based on IRT, and it was developed on old IBM PCs, and we used floppy disks, and we had, had uh, some desktops that had two floppy disks and maybe a five, gig, five megabyte five megabyte hard drive, and we were doing adaptive testing, and that was in the 19, early 1980s after uh, IBM compatible, and why they were ever called IBM compatible, I have no idea, PCs came out, uh, and they were, we were running DOS, and then we migrated, uh, eventually we migrated off the DOS systems as Windows became available, and MicroCAT went to uh, to Windows. We've never developed it for the Macintosh, however. And um, in the process, um, it became obviously independent of, of PCs. And uh, we've continued to improve MicroCAD over the years in the Windows environment. And most recently, we have moved uh, at least one of our item analysis software packages, item and onto, uh, onto the web so that it's basically item and anywhere you can run it from your smartphone or any, any other device. So uh, MicroCAD has grown and has been renamed FastTest uh, over the years because the MicroCAD label didn't really apply because we were doing adaptive testing and related item parameter estimation and so on on microcomputers that we, we were using web. So that's it's kind of the evolution of, uh, of MicroCAD into FastTest in a nutshell. Okay, thank you. Um, and just coincidentally, I was looking through the attendees list here and Renee Dallas is listening in. Hey, comrade Dallas. <laughs> Actually, I just spent some time with him yesterday. He's doing well. Oh, that's good to hear. I still have not met Renee and I think I would like to. You've never met him? No. Oh, the next, next time we, we do a Zoom, we're doing Zoom now because uh, I don't want to bring any germs into his house. He's 93. Oh, yeah, that's understandable. All right. Uh, so we, you mentioned ASC uh, being founded in 1979 with uh, Dave Vale. We just talked about uh, MicroCAT. So what led you to founding ASC? Well, it became pretty clear as we were doing... Uh, work on adaptive testing in the 70s that there was uh, eventually going to be a need for software number one to implement IRT. Now there were some other software packages, uh, Daryl Box Company Scientific Software had developed Bilog and Multilog around the time that we developed um, Excalibur for uh, item parameter estimation, for IRT item parameter estimation. Uh, and all of those initially were unidimensional. And uh, we looked at bilog and multilog uh, when they came out and saw that they were uh, pretty complicated. You needed to be a sophisticated user and we wanted to develop uh, item analysis software and eventually adaptive testing software that could be used by anybody who at least knew the basics of IRT and the basics of adaptive testing. So we saw the, uh, the commercial potential there and, and the need for uh, uh, making stuff available so that adaptive testing in IRT itself could uh, spread around the world and replace the paper and pencil test. 
Yes. Speaking of which, um, in about 1970, around that time, I was invited to, uh, to, to the Iowa testing programs in Iowa City to talk about, theoretically, my uh, work in vocational psychology, but decided I'd rather talk about my ideas in computer adapt computerized adaptive testing. So I went down there and I gave a little lecture on the use of computers and testing. And um, after I was done, a bunch of people came up, started asking me questions, and all of a sudden the crowd parted, which was like the Red Sea parting for Moses. <laughs> and mm -hmm. this uh, gray-haired guy walked, wearing a suit and tie, walks up, and he says, young man, I don't know where you get your ideas, but the computer will never replace the paper and pencil test. Wow. <laughs> that was short-sighted. <laughs> he turned around and he walked away. <laughs> so I, I had no idea who he was. I said, so who is that? Who, who was that? Um, he said, he's the director of the IO testing programs and the founder of the IO testing programs. So he saw the computer as basically as a threat to his empire at that time. Oh, but yeah. I, I, to me, that was like waving a red flag <laughs> in front of a bull. You know, that, that's all I needed was somebody to tell me that it was wrong. <laughs> You're the kind of kid that somebody tells you. Yeah, I, I was 35. This guy was probably 60, 65. He's getting ready to retire, probably. And, uh, you know, he's been around a lot longer than I had, but I was the rebel. Mm -hmm. I think I was 35. I was about that. Oh, yeah. Um, no, I think it was no, 36, 37. I don't know. Yeah, it was the, the same thing that got me interested in working with uh, uh, ASC, you know, for the past 14 years uh, was that things like IRT and adaptive testing shouldn't just be, you know, behind the ivory towers of those big billion dollar assessment uh, companies or you know, even something like uh, Iowa testing programs. Uh, there's a lot of modernization that can go happen. And it's, you know, like Prometheus bringing uh, fire to the people. It's like more organizations can still use IRT if we had user-friendly software out to do it. Um, though we're still fighting that battle too, both with that and with the paper and pencil test delivery since you know, we just had that news about the SAT finally going digital. Um, and, you know, other assessment organizations have been doing it like how long has NWA been doing their exams on computer? Was that 1983? Something like that, yeah. Yeah. So it's certainly not new, that's for sure. No, and, and unfortunately, there's some negative trends going on. One of those negative trends is, is the movement backward toward um, multi-stage tests in place of adaptive tests by big organizations, notably Educational Testing Service and... Um, that's a giant step, as I said a couple of years ago at one of the IACAT conferences. That's a giant step backward because the, the early work in adaptive testing was two-stage tests. And two-stage is simply a, the simple case of a multi-stage test. And uh, we know that two-stage tests and multi-stage tests are not as good as item-by-item -item adaptive tests. But ETS and their wisdom decided to move back the clock that's true 50 um, years 50 years that's a long time to move it back yep uh you mentioned iacat twice now um so i wanted to, to plug that for our listeners if you haven't joined it is free to join iacat it is iacat.org um and we hold a conference every other year usually an odd number of years but because of uh covid we delayed it a year and it'll be held uh this fall in frankfurt germany at uh, get the university um, so if you're interested, go to that website and please join us to learn more about CAT at that conference. Uh, we just had a question from Mohammed Mubarak. Uh, do you think that CAT can be used to measure the academic achievement of school students? And how do you explain these results to the parent? Um, I can give an initial response to this and the answer is absolutely yes. There are a large number of organizations that do this. Um, there are a number of uh, very large scale delivery platforms in the US like NWA that we've mentioned, Renaissance Learning, uh, imagine learning and so on that these these do adaptive test delivery of educational testing and 
uh, they will uh, provide scaled scores to the students and the parents to help them interpret it. So instead of providing data, they'll provide like, uh, I think the NAP scales students from 200 to 900 or something like that. Um, and that's all K-12 students. So like you expect third graders to be 270 to 290 and you expect fourth graders to be 290 to 340 or something like that. Um, but uh, Dave, what do you think about uh, using CAT for academic achievement? What are the benefits when it comes to retesting, vertical scaling, and things like that? Well, um, as, as they mentioned, CAT is being used for achievement testing in a lot of places. And um, the, the issue of explaining the results to parents is no different than explaining the results of any test to parents. Um, they get a score and the score can be converted onto any scale that you like. It doesn't have to be on the theta scale with uh, scores below zero is negative and those above zero is positive. You can convert it to a mean of 50 and standard deviation of 10, a mean of 100 and standard deviation of 20, whatever you want, like any other test score. Uh, one of the advantages that I see of uh, adaptive testing in, IR, in using IRT is that in IRT, you not only get a score for an individual, but you also get an individual error of measurement associated with that score. And what that means is, and of course you're gonna say, well, how do you explain that to, to a parent? Uh, that means that you can put an error band around the score instead of saying, well, your kid's score is um, 120 on a score scale of, with a mean of 100 and a standard deviation of 20. So they one standard deviation above the mean, which is at the 84th percentile, if it were normally distributed, which it probably isn't anyway. <laughs> but anyway, um, so you can put this error band around scores and then uh, communicate that to the parents and say that, okay, our best estimate of the score is 120, but it you know, could be as high as 125, could be as low as uh, 115. Uh, because all scores have some level of inaccuracy. And I, I think that's something that using IRT, we go through this whole process of using IRT to estimate theta, and then we uh, convert it to a score and we output a single number and we're throwing away information. That information is important because it tells you something about how good your measurements are. And when, when you do any kind of measurements, physical measurements, you get on a scale, you, you get on your bathroom scale and you, and you weigh, let's say 160, and then you get off and you get back on, you weigh 158, and you get back on, and you weigh 162, depending on how accurate, how precise your scale is, how good your scale is. Well, measurements in psychology are the same way. They, they are somewhat imprecise, and I think it's, it's important for us to communicate that imprecision when we communicate uh, to, to parents and other stakeholders. But anyway, to get back to the question of adaptive testing, well, why would we want to use adaptive testing? Well, we use adaptive testing because it gives us scores that can be more precise for any given individual. And so um, with a good adaptive test, we can get better scores and better scores allow us to make better decisions. Yeah, absolutely. You know, research has shown, uh, you know, on average, I would say you can reduce the test length by 50% without any loss of precision, right? Oh, at least, yeah, depend, depending on the, uh, on the item bank and how, how you implement your depth of test. Yeah, I remember you and I did that work on one of those mood disorder personality questionnaires like 20 years ago, and it ended up being more than 90% reduction in terms of test length because they're the original assessment was 600 items, which was just bizarrely too long. Oh, the original was 600 items. I think I got it down about 28 yeah. <laughs> on, on average or something like that. Yeah. Um, now, 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 you may raise the question of well, what does this increase in precision from adaptive testing bias, other than we can say that this score is better than the score that you would get out of a conventional test. Now, I'm in the process of investigating that question right now, and I have a little bit of data that I can share with you uh, without showing you the details. Basically, what I did was I asked that question. Uh, if we have scores from real adaptive tests, and there are 
differences in the precision of the scores across individuals. If I subdivide my group of individuals, let's say I've got 500 individuals into subgroups based on their precision. So I've got a group of very precise measurements for some individuals and a little less precise and a little less precise. And I've got a group of measurements that are pretty bad uh, for the lowest group of individuals. Well, what I did was I took some data like that and uh, computed the validity against an external criterion for the total group. And that validity was about 0.2. And then I looked at the validity within each of the subgroups and what I found was that in the high precision group, the validity was as high as 0.6. Wow. Not 0.2, but 0.6. And as precision decreased, as the standard error of measurement increased, the validity dropped. It was a beautiful moderator effect. Now, I haven't run moderated regression yet. This is a classical moderator analysis. So what that tells me is that because adaptive tests are more precise than conventional tests of the same length and can be equally precise to a conventional test at much shorter lengths, but let's take the first scenario where they're more precise than conventional tests, we should get better predictive validity, much better predictive validity from adaptive tests than we do from conventional tests. And I'm in the process right now of replicating that finding. I've replicated it in one small data set. I'm looking at replicating it in another data set. And I think I'm getting the same kind of results, not as striking, but a similar result where as you increase the error of measurement in a group, the validity goes down. You expect that from classical test theory. Nobody, as far as I know, has demonstrated with, uh, with IRT and with adaptive testing. So I'm replicating it in conventional tests. I'm trying to replicate it with adaptive tests. So if anybody's got any data sets where they have validity criterion, a predictor that can be scored by IRT, let me know. I'd love to play with your data and see if I can replicate that in your data. Yeah, that's a very good point about how, like you said, we're often throwing away information by not considering standard error of measurement when we do predictive analyses or other types of validation. Yeah, when, when I looked at uh, standard error across the group as a predictor variable, and in addition to uh, theta predicting the same criterion that I was just talking about, <clears throat> the um, multiple regression of uh, theta plus standard error at the individual level was almost as high as the moderated correlation for the um, very precise measurement group. So that, that, that was a uh, suppressor effect, that it serves a suppressor effect, and I'm, I'm looking to replicate that as well. Wow. Uh, well, speaking of applications, we just had uh, two comments in the chat about uh, applications. One is from Christian Barassa, PhD student specialized in CAT and IRT and also a research professional at University de Montreal. Uh, he says, we're currently adapting, developing a computerized adaptive placement test for Quebec's immigrants. Um, that's a very interesting project. I'm, I'm just gonna ask, is it on like job skills in general or is it just like on languages? Okay, languages. Yeah, I believe there's a similar project going on in uh, Netherlands uh, with testing immigrants for Dutch uh, that is uh, being worked on with CEDO. I'm not sure if you're uh, uh, involved with them at all or in contact with them. Uh, but that's a very interesting uh, project. And then also uh, Tokazani Chizali from Malawi, uh, he's doing research on assessing the reliability of CATs for college entrance communication skills examinations in Malawi. He says Malawi has never administered CAT exams. And I'm trying to advocate for that after studying this benefits for providing precise measurement. Um, uh, yeah, uh, I, we can certainly help you. Uh, you said you asked for some advice. We can give you some advice and provide free access to our adaptive testing platform for research. Um, our test, we talked about MicroGraph before. MicroGraph is now called FastTest. 
Um, and we make fast test available for research projects with graduate students. Uh, we did it for University of Johannesburg last year. Um, and I can put you in touch with the researchers there. You might be interested. Uh, with that, uh, does anybody else have any questions for Dr. Weiss about, you know, his uh, the original background to getting interested in psychology uh, or the uh, seminal computerized adaptive testing research with uh, IDA response theory and uh, stratified adaptive or stradaptive exams in the 70s or later applications of CAT to um, more uh, uh, assessment situations like we were talking about the patient report of outcomes. Uh, we still have a couple of minutes left here. If any of you have any questions that you'd like to pose to Dr. Weiss. Uh, meanwhile, I did have another question on my list. Um, Dr. Weiss, how many grad students would you say you've worked with uh, over the years? Well, you know, I just did a rough count the other day. I think there's 37. 37. I suppose that's just the ones that uh, did the finish the dissertation with you. There's many more that you've worked with, especially that have come from other areas, right? Uh, yeah, there, there's a couple, couple of my former students who never finished for various reasons. Uh, and then there, there were a bunch of MA students, people who decided they didn't want to go on for PhDs, but that doesn't, that's not included in the 37. And, and on the psychology department website, there's a, a, a list, a searchable list of uh, PhDs for the whole department identified by advisors. I, I went through that the other day just because I thought you might ask me that question. <laughs> and then wow. did a rough, rough count. I might, might have miscounted. I don't know. Okay, very interesting. Uh, Neil Perinas just asked, how do you see the future of CAT? Um, what could be next if there's any? Well, I think the future of CAT is multidimensional with qualifications. Uh, multidimensional CAT is, it has been developed based on multidimensional IRT, <clears throat> has a problem that is rarely addressed. It's addressed, but it's, it's sort of written off. And that's the problem uh, that the multidimensional models that are used uh, now, the ones that Mark Rikas has developed and others have used, and, and I have applied myself in the uh, Mayo Clinic project, um, are compensatory. And what that means is that a high score on one dimension can compensate for a low score on another dimension. Now, to me, that is illogical in the context of ability and achievement measurement but probably is okay in the context of attitude measurement, personality measurement, patient reported outcome measurements, where there is the possibility, at least theoretically from a psychological point of view, where certain characteristics of an individual can compensate for other characteristics in terms of, of outcome variables. But in the context of, um, Ability and achievement measurement, I think it's illogical. Uh, I take the extreme example of uh, you're trying to measure mathematics achievement and you give somebody a word problem and there's certain mathematical, uh, certain arithmetic operations or mathematical operations necessary to solve that problem. But the, the context is in a given language. And if I take that question and give it to a person who is not familiar with that language, there's no way that a very high mathematical ability can compensate for the lack of, of, uh, of verbal ability in that particular language. So I think that multidimensional IRT uh, is useful outside the ability and achievement domain, but I have problems with it in the ability and achievement domain. Now, many years ago, Brad Simpson developed uh, a what he called a non-compensatory model uh, and some others have called it a partially compensatory model in in which uh, the the, the uh, multi-dimensional uh, operation is one not of addition which is compensatory across traits but it's multiplicative so that if you are very low on one trait 
and you multiply that low probability times a high probability on another trait, the low probability is going to drag down the high probability on the other trait. And that, that's a partially compensatory model. But then there are operational problems in implementing that model. So even though multidimensional IRT is useful in certain areas of ad adaptive testing, I don't think it's going to be universally uh, useful because it violates that um, uh, the compensate the, the the traits involved can violate the compensatory assumption in the model. Or put another way, the model is not appropriate for certain kinds of traits. Um, where adaptive testing is going to go in the future, I think that one of the things that we need to do, and it may turn out this is not IRT-based adaptive testing, is we need to uh, use the capabilities of computers now with the graphics and, and, uh, and all the other advanced capabilities of computers that we didn't have 50 years ago when we first started out to make our testing more realistic, more interactive, even moving toward uh, eventually maybe even virtual reality uh, so that we can put people in a situation and measure what they do in that situation, which should get us more uh, uh, higher levels of validity simply because the testing situation basically mimics the situation that we're trying to predict. And so, I, I, and then the other thing I th think we need to do is adaptive testing needs to be much more closely integrated with instruction. And actually, uh, when I coined the term adaptive testing in 1971 or 1972, um, I used the term adaptive because at that time they were, the Plato system was talking about adaptive instruction. And so, uh, Adaptive testing used to be tailored testing, response contingent testing, uh, branch testing, and you know, a bunch of other kinds of, of terms that refer to it. But I wanted to emphasize the fact that ultimately adaptive testing and adaptive instruction should be merged. And everything that happens in an instructional, computer-based instructional context should be used to measure the individual without testing being separate from instruction. I won't be around to see it happen. But maybe this will happen. Yeah, there's definitely some work on that, uh, though. Too, you know, that's what Alina von Davier is working on, and um, yeah, some of the other uh, educational assessment companies, or uh, their e-learning companies, as well as educational assessment like Renaissance Learning and Imagine Learning. Um, it, we talked about uh, like uh, item types and simulations and that sort of thing. We had two questions about that. Uh, one asked, "Is there any way to use CAT test other than MCQ?" And somebody else asked about doing performance exams beyond multiple choice items. And uh, those are definitely the case. You know, I uh, mentioned the mood disorder that Dr. Rice and I had worked on 20 years ago. We were doing Likert-based items for that. Um, the Mayo Clinic project that he's working on and other patient reported uh, adaptive tests use Likert style items with the, uh, um, the uh, Sam Gita's graded response model. Uh, my dissertation uh, looked at using a uh, the generalized partial credit model in CAT. So th there are certainly uh, types of uh, CATs out there that use that. Uh, th there's also uh, one of the new things where Dr. Tobias is talking about simulations is the use of process data. So if you think about uh, a question where you've got you know, a bunch of countries on a map and a student has to draw five labels over to label five countries, um, the, conventionally that's gonna be scored on zero to five points with the generalized partial credit model but there's so many other pieces of information that are being gathered there in terms of what's being dragged first, is it being dragged off to the side uh, before being dragged to the correct answer. Uh, there's all this type of information that's not being collected on uh, computerized adaptive uh, or computerized testing. And there's, a, a, I think, a, a green field there in terms of how to use that sort of information in CAT. Uh, Dr. Weiss, uh, Cha Hung Chang also uh, asked a question. Uh, can you share your thoughts on CAT and AI integration? What was the last part of your question? Uh, can you share your thoughts on CAT and AI integration? AI, artificial intelligence? Mm -hmm. uh, well, CAT is artificial intelligence. That, that's what I always say, too. You know, it's something that would, was done by humans years ago with uh, Stanford Binet, right? 
yeah, we, yeah, we, we were doing adaptive testing in the 70s and the concept of artificial intelligence didn't pop up until what, 10, 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. And I read a quote once saying that artificial intelligence is always like three years ahead of what we're doing right now because we think of something that is vague and super advanced, but really it's uh, in a lot of cases stuff that we're doing right now. No, it's artificial intelligence is, uh, is machines uh, basically um, the way I look at it, uh, adapting to the individual. And that's what adaptive testing does. Yeah, because really adaptive testing goes back even farther than Stanford Vidalini. You talk about you know, professors giving oral exams to their students 500 years ago to the university, right? They would adapt the difficulty level. Yeah, or me medical doctors <clears throat> going through a medical interview where you ask a question and depending on how they how the patient responds, you go down one path, and if they respond a different way, you go down another path, and, and you look for different kinds of indicators of different kinds of diseases and that sort of stuff. That's adaptive testing. Yep, I totally agree. All right, we've got one more question before we finish up here, and that's from uh, Dennis Federiakin on uh, what do you think on CAT with CDMs, cognitive diagnostic models? Uh, with CAT with the cognitive diagnostic models. I haven't really followed that literature very carefully, so uh, I, I'm not sure. I have a vague idea about how cognitive diagnostic models work. They're uh, basically late, late in class models, and uh, I don't see why it can't, can't be applied to them. I'm just not sure how. Okay. Yeah, in a lot of cases, I think it's parallel where they provide a cat to get an overall score, but then they also use a cognitive diagnostic model to give a, like a, a skill profile of where students are in their fractions knowledge. Can they divide fractions, add fractions, multiply fractions, that sort of thing. Um, if you're interested in that, I recommend you go look at the work by Allison Yang Cheng at the University of Notre Dame. She's one of the leading researchers on that. Uh, then we just had one late question here, which I think would be a great one to edit, end on. Um, and that is, I'd like to know which achievement you are most proud of. You'd like to know what? Which achievement you are most proud of. Which achievement I'm most proud of. Ooh, that's a tough one. Well, let's see. I uh, pretty much started the field of cat, so that's one. Uh, I found that it's... Uh, Applied Psychological Measurement, that's two. Um, Nate and I found an IOCAT, which is three. And then there's Assessment Systems, that's four. And then there's Nate, I'm proud of Nate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it wasn't easy guiding me through your program, I'm sure. Well, I, I, I guess it would be a CAT because I've stuck with it for, for 50 years now. Yep, and it's touched a lot of people. And you think of how many students have taken a CAT exam over the past 30, 40 yeah, years. Yeah, it, it, it's been gratifying to see it spread throughout the world. And uh, I'd, I'd like to see it spread some more. So we, we need some more spreaders, <laughs> people who are going to carry, carry the message and implement CAT. And, uh, and I, I should mention um, that if, if I live long enough, I'm uh, writing a book on CAT, and I've got another chapter and a half to go. So uh, maybe in a, a year or so, uh, you'll see a, a book from me and Nate and another fella from um, Turkey uh, that goes into the basics of CAT and how to implement a CAT system and all that sort of stuff. So finally writing it all down, I've resisted it for so long but it's, it's a big project. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, and uh, thank you to all the uh, attendees uh, for listening in and providing such excellent questions. I'm glad we had such good attendance here and then this will be recorded and uh, hopefully be put up for anyone else who wasn't able to attend. Uh, and then of course, lastly, I'd like to thank Dr. Weiss for providing us an hour of his time and uh, giving us such a wonderful uh, story about you know, how he got interested in psychological assessment and where they led them down, where that led him down 60 years of research. And thank you all for coming. I appreciate the opportunity. Okay, excellent. With that, I will 
shut this down and everybody have a wonderful afternoon wherever you are. Thank you, Nate.